This is Terry Elton, and this session will look at the book Simple Habits for Complex Minds and the model of change that they offer in their final chapter. Lead Change as the New Normal is the title of this chapter. Now, this book explores the new ways that leaders need to act, think, and be during times of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. The two offers in this book focus on three things, how to strategize, how to give and receive feedback, and how to communicate. And they offer three habits of the mind, asking different questions, taking multiple perspectives, and seeing systems. In the end, their hope is to help leaders learn to grow and to grow other leaders around them in the midst of uncertain times. So this final chapter offers a framework for addressing adaptive challenges or challenges of which that we don't know how to deal with and that challenge our own assumptions going into a situation. They do that by offering seven responses which create the conditions for successful change in the midst of uncertain times. Now, in certain or predictable times, we can often have a linear model or one that if we do step by step by step, this is more of an iterative process or a way of creating an ecology that in the midst of uncertainty, the conditions are such that we can lead into new possibilities. So the rest of this session, will look at the seven responses that they offer. The first one, is to determine what is predictable and what's not. And then to lean into leading into those unpredictable situations. The authors remind us that our brains and our bodies, our minds and our bodies are searching for predictability, for patterns of what's probable so that they can make choices about the future, kind of turning down the risks and opening up the opportunity for success. Now, in these times, those kinds of ways of being aren't most helpful. But to remember that our bodies and our minds are not only searching for predictability, but they're wired that way. And so leading into this time requires us to be conscious of the habits and the ways that we frame situations and then going, acting differently, being, being vigilant about going after these different kinds of problem solving methods. So once we've determined what it is, we have to tease apart what in this situation is complex and what is more predictable. And then once we've teased those apart, our role as leaders is to create systems and rituals to lead in the midst of these complex times. You see, um, in those times, we often jump really quickly to what the problem is that we need to solve. And so one of the first things that's important for this as we think about creating the systems is creating opportunity space to slow down, to discover and reflect on what is actually the problem and what are the present conditions in the system that are making that possible. From that, we're able to ritualize, actually, solution avoidance. This is actually stepping into the four domains of is looking at a situation. Is this simple? Is it complicated? Is it complex? Or is it chaotic? And asking each other collectively how we each see that. And that is best done through action learning groups or groups that are pulled together with people from different perspectives from around the organization, that their main job is to come together to look at this situation. And once they've done, it's disband. So it's a, it's a fluid team. It's a team that comes together for this particular learning. So the first one is to determine what is predictable and what is not. The second is to create a feedback-rich organization. The authors here claim that feedback gives insights to leaders and to the organization about what actually needs 
to change. Feedback is the lifeblood of change in a complex world. And in fact, the authors found in their work with different organizations around the world that a core difference between teams that thrive and those that falter is the quality and the amount of feedback. Not only available to a few people, but available to everyone. In this way, feedback is a foundational building block on which change then gets built. So learning to give feedback and to receive feedback is a core skill that leaders need to develop and organizations that want to live well in complex times really give attention to. Not only do we have to learn to give and receive feedback, but we have to organize the system so that it knows what to do with it, so that it can take it in and it can let that information flow to the areas in the organization that it needs to. So often we have been protective of feedback, leaving it in just kind of a small part of the organization. And there's a whole continuum between what needs to be protected and what should be shared. And so the authors are encouraging organizations to move into the area of sharing more of that feedback. The other thing that they talk about is not only do you give and receive it, not only do you organize it, but then how do you talk about what you have learned and see how is it shaping the organization? Is it shaping the organization in the way that you want it to? If not, what do you need to do to adjust it? And that you change systems accordingly. One of the great methods or ways of really putting this into the culture is by telling stories about how feedback actually impacted or changed the thinking or acting of you or the leadership of this organization. Um, Doing rich feedback not only creates the conditions for healthy organizations, it also creates the conditions for organizations to be more prepared for and responsive to the environment when changes come that are complex. It, it actually gives you some muscle memory that you know how to use that is very helpful in those times. The third area is choose a direction and build guardrails. Creating boundaries is important so you know what is actually in and what is out. It's not the same as creating a plan, as saying, here's the things that we're going for, but it is saying, this is the direction, this is the movement that we want to go. Organizations in complex times need two things that sometimes are at odds with each other. One is alignment. How how do we all face in the same direction? But the second is diversity. And so often we do alignment and we, in In predictable times, we say, here's the strategy, and we kind of tone down the diversity, or we don't open it up to a diverse set of voices. In this way, leaders in complex times have to work hard to loosen boundaries, not tighten them. One of the examples they use in the book is where an organization, a social service organization, partners with one of their their IT companies that they work with to actually come together to help solve this issue. But what that means is the organization has to open itself, be vulnerable, if you will, to working with organizations that come at the problem in a very different way. If the organization doesn't create these guardrails, this boundary about what's in and out, people will. If they don't set a direction, people will do the same. And so the hope here is that the organization can name it together rather than have people individually or teams individually have to figure this out um, on their own. Now, don't worry. Um, Part of being a feedback-rich organization is that feedback will change us. And so one of the things that can change is that the guardrails or the boundaries can be adapted over time if that's what the organization decides needs to happen. It's better to state them and change them than to not put them there at all.
The fourth area is to examine the present and look for attractors. This is about looking for clues in the present. So often the predictability is based on the past and we don't yet know what's happening in the future. But we can look to the present and see what are the attractors in this system that we can look for that gives us clues about the way this system naturally responds. Change in complex times is not linear or logical. In fact, one of the things that we learned very quickly is that change can come from all kinds of places in the system and it can be triggered by all different kinds of elements. So to make change in complex systems, we one of the ways to do that is to pay attention to the attractors and say, what are they attracting? And how can those attractors be changed so that there's different results that ripple throughout the system? Number five, experiment and learn. These two things, both experimenting and learning put together, are key in unpredictable times. And the job of the leader in uncertain and unpredictable times is to widen the range of things that you're going to go after, not narrow, to enable multiple experiments, not just one, and to encourage and almost insist upon learning as opposed to being so driven by success or having that be the sole thing that we go after. By widening the range, by multiplying the experiments, and then by encouraging learning, those three coming together give clues about which direction the organization will want to go and experiment more and lean more into as they move forward. Now, often organizations at this point say it's time to reorganize. And so they redo their org chart and they move people around. And the authors remind us that reorganizing the system doesn't always change the results. And in fact, sometimes reorganizing the system can actually be a distraction from the real work that needs to be done. The truth is it's a both and. It needs, the system needs to continue its core work that it has been doing and it needs to live into a new way of being. And the question is, how do you bring people into that change? Do you force it upon them? Or are there ways you can empower it naturally to bubble up from within? In the book, they give some examples of organizations that one changes the structure to get to the new place and the other kind of does experiments and let it bubble up from below. And they talk about when they totally redid the organizational chart, one of the consequences of that was it disrupted both their core work, way of doing work and the trust. And it distracted them from them living into some new behaviors. As opposed to another organization that brought people into a new way of being while not disrupting overall the ecology. And over time, they were able to bring more and more people in. Now, there's not one right or wrong way to do it, but the question is, how do you do experiments and how do you learn from it as the key, not how do you reorganize? Sixth area, communicate clearly in times of uncertainty. It's a reminder that this kind of approach to change is both emergent and disrupted, or distributed. It is emergent in that we don't know steps three, four, five, and six when we begin. And it's distributed in that multiple things are going on at the same time. And so how do you communicate clearly in the midst of this different kind of change process? They highlight two things that always have to be woven together. One is to communicate the mindset or that this is a different way of leading change. So you're talking about the change process. At the same time, you're giving the reason why. Why is this change important? Why is it important that our organization begins to do this kind of work? As you communicate, it's important to get clear on these things. You'll already have heard them. What's our direction? What are our guardrails? 
What is the process for creating the conditions for safe to fail experiments? In other words, experiments that don't throw the whole organization under the bus or the leaders that are doing it, that um, are at the right scale and scope of our work that we that it will both help us learn and not um, not be detrimental to the overall goal that we're going after. And then finally, the importance of learning. As we communicate, storytelling is huge. Stories carry the culture. They carry it both what has been and they help us tell how it could be and is evolving as we move into the future. And stories do this lovely thing of blending logic and emotion. When we listen deeply to the people we're both trying to serve and the people within our organization, we hear stories and metaphors, both around the values that ground us, about the tensions and the opportunities in the present that may give point to where we want to go in the future. So blending logic and emotion as we draw people into this change process is critical and stories are a huge way of doing that. The authors say in complex and ambiguous times of change, leaders can't communicate a clear story about a destination or the map for getting there. They can communicate the big story about the vision, however, and help people feel safe about telling stories about the careful use of guardrails and support the telling of stories about the safe to fail experiments that worked and the ones that failed. And as they do, they help a learning merge emerge from among them. And finally, the seventh response is plan for the long road. This is a huge commitment to having leaders in complex times grow a growth mindset. The world is making a whole different set of demands upon us. And as we learn to grow ourselves and as we help others around us grow, we become more and more prepared to live with this challenge. And they say these habits aren't just what we face at work. They're also what we face at home, and we do it there all the time. So the whole fabric of our lives is woven into times of vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Let me just give you an example. I think of many people who are living with older parents that are leading into their senior um, years of life that are experiencing health issues, memory issues, um, spouse relationships are changing because of health issues, and they're living with a lot of this uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, We have had that in parenting at different stages of life, uh, early on in teenage years, whatever, These are things that we have maps for, we have developmental ideas about, but everybody's journey is different. And what if the habits that we're talking about in this book were habits that not only made us survive those times, but also help us live with joy among those times? This is actually kind of fun news, right? It's to say, what if learning to be on a growth mindset, that life is a journey, not a destination, could actually help us not only lead better in complex times, but be woven into having more joy in our life overall. The authors say these habits are intended to offer us new ways to live with joy in a world that often can't supply what we most wish for. The complex world will not get more simple to make us comfortable. Now is our chance to grow as big as the world requires us to be. So, leading change is normal. And leading change in the midst of complex times is the new normal. So our question 
is, will you be able to live not asking the world to get simple for you so you can be comfortable, but so that we may approach the world that we live in as a chance to grow as big as the world, not only with what has happened before, but with the possibilities that lie ahead.